Right, so last night I was having a look through some Instagram stories and I saw one from Honest Mammy. Okay, um, she got a question up about issues with digestion during perimenopause and that kind of thing. And I thought that is one thing that is not spoke about a lot. And um, I don't know if it's just because people don't know much about it, or is it just an Irish thing that people feel embarrassed about it? Like, you can't be talking about that kind of thing around hormones and menopause and sex. I don't know. I don't think we live in the Stone Age yet. I guarantee you right now, if you turn to your husband and say, what happens during perimenopause and during menopause? And I guarantee you he'll just stare back at you like a crow staring into a packet of potatoes. An empty packet of potatoes. Just... So I'm going to explain a lot of things that have that go on during Perry. That I'm going to break it down nice and simple, but show you that it's not just a hormonal thing here. It's to do with your gut and the brain. And I'll keep it simple enough. Okay, we don't want to turn into a fucking big scientific study. So as men, we are pretty lucky and you should count yourself lucky and uh, that you're not a woman because the amount of shit that they have to go through is our men's sex hormone, our men hormone is testosterone and it just declines slowly over time. If you get a big decline, what happens? You don't get the horn. Get a blue tablet, pop it in, bang. You're as hard as a 16 year old walking into a pub. Just remember though, Centrum vitamin tablets are blue as well, so don't get them mixed up. A lot of people will know what menopause is. If they'll just give it a thick answer and say, stop getting periods. Okay, but the thing is why and the symptoms of why certain things happen. That's what I'm going to explain here. So what does perimenopause mean? Well, it's just a Greek word thrown in front of menopause. Peri meaning around menopause. So perimenopause menopause, menopause is just the body's natural transition to menopause. So let's go through the symptoms and why it is connected through the gut and the brain. So when this transition starts, what happens is estrogen levels in the body start to deteriorate, start to drop, slowly okay now one symptom that a lot of people say um, or they have during this phase is nausea or vomiting and so on okay it all leads down to the gut so now that you have a drop in estrogen and uh, there's a hormone imbalance okay this will affect your follicle stimulating hormones okay and it's the same thing when someone gets pregnant okay so a lot of people get morning sickness it's because of the follicle stimulating hormone same thing so that's why a lot of women when they start going through perimenopause the fsh can make them nauseous make them get sick so that's why some people think they might be pregnant because they've got morning sickness and unfortunately this isn't the only physiological effect that women are going to feel because there's going to be a lot of lot more psychological effects too okay so believe it or not a lot of your estrogen receptors are in the gut um i usually pronounce this wrong your microbiome i say and microbiome mothers say but uh, let's just put it as microorganisms microbacteria in the stomach okay they help regulate estrogen so basically your microbiota <laughs> works by essentially creating an enzyme that converts estrogen into its active form where it's used by the body now when this is affected when estrogen level drop how does that affect you well number one is bile secretion so low estrogen will affect the production and flow of bile now where does this come into play here because what is bile for, okay bile is used for many things okay but where does it apply here one of the main things it's used for is the breakdown of our met metabolizing fat so essentially if you're not creating enough bile then your digestive system is going to have a terrible time trying to digest fats 
And this then will have a knock-on effect in raising cholesterol. LDL cholesterol. The shitty kind. And if you're not creating enough bile, then you're going to have an issue with peristalsis. Plain English peristalsis is how quick your body shoves food through your digestive system out your arse. Sorry, maybe a bit too graphic. How quick it moves through your body, through your digestive system, to through your bowels. That better? I prefer how quick, how long it takes you to have a shit. Yes, women poo, although they might wait till the, the hair dryers turn it on before they go, in case anyone hears them, but yeah. So that means that what would usually take 24 hours to go through your system is now slowed down to 36 hours or even 48 hours, and this will lead to bloating, cramps, wind, and so on. And what does that do? Well, what? Does it do or what else is in the stomach that can also be fucked up is your serotonin because believe it or not the majority of your serotonin is created in the stomach of the brain okay so if you're constipated or clogged up and windy you're not going to really get much food through there's not going to be much serotonin uptake which is a feel-good hormone okay you don't ever see anyone feeling happy when they're constipated do you God, it's great, I'm constipated. No, no, they're usually pretty depressed. No, I don't mean you just have to be constipated to like not get serotonin. If estrogen has dropped and it's going to affect your good bacteria and so on, you're not going to create as much serotonin and it's like your gut brain axis, okay? So then it comes up, bang. This is where it starts to hit you, psychological. Now your gut bacteria regulates neurophysiological behaviors by altering a lot of things like neural, endocrine and immune pathways. English Peter, please. Well, ugh, squeeze me. It can affect your um, neural pathways by cognitive function, um, make you feel depressed or it can alter your memory. There's a lot of issues here that it can alter. And estrogen depletion can also have an effect on your motor coordination. I don't mean driving the car. I mean motor functions, the body, you know. So your gut is also lined with cells like a barrier or like an inverted condom for all the world, right? That um, keeps your stomach enzymes where they should be in the stomach, keeps them in place. Okay, so that's what happens with a healthy gut. Now, your gut bacteria works in tandem with estrogen to create a strong inner gut condom for all the world. Now, what happens when estrogen is lowered? It can't create such a great barrier. You also must remember as well, the stomach is always moving, okay? When you're sitting there, it's not just like sitting still, okay? It's like a fucking accordion, okay? <laughs> It's churning constantly and moving because it needs to, it's like a cement mixer for all the world, okay? So when the estrogen is lowered, the integrity of that inner stomach condom becomes weakened, and now it becomes a pound shop condom, okay? And because of that, it's a lot weaker. And this can have a lead to T cell production, which can cause food sensitivities and a few other things. That's why certain foods trigger certain people as well to go. Ugh! And then going back to the head, what do we have up here? Well, in the majority of people, if you look through and you can see through the ears, well, then there's nothing up there, just fucking spider webs. But the majority of people have a brain, okay? And in there we have the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus controls metabolism, endocrine system it's basically like the cpu of your body so that change in hormones is going to aggravate hypothalamus and that's going to signal the cortex of the adrenal gland to release cortisol the stress hormone which will induce stress induce cramps and just stress and you know what stress does and another reason why the hypothalamus is important because it controls your metabolism and it does this through your 
thyroid. Okay, so you can see what's all tying in here. And now you're at risk because what happens is, even though your estrogen is dropping, progesterone can drop even lower, which can cause estrogen dominance. And what happens here then is, now while your thyroid is doing its job, the high estrogen is telling your liver to create TBG, which is thyroid binding globulin, or globulin, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Which, this protein is then released into the bloodstream and binds to the T3 and T4 cells that was released by your thyroid. They cannot do their job, so now you experience symptoms of hypothyroidism. Not hyper, hypo. Fatigued. Tired. Now, the majority of clients I have who would be going through perimenopause, I do ask them questions. And do you get cravings? And the majority of them say yes, they get salt cravings. Or can signal adrenal fatigue. And this is a vicious cycle with the feel good quick fix hormones, okay? Because with low serotonin, body wants a quick fix of carbs okay it wants a quick fix of a dopamine boost and so on but this is where it becomes a vicious cycle again because it's a catch-22 because you have the sugary snack and what happens you get that spike but crash and then you need to have more and you get the spike and then you crash and it's a vicious vicious cycle that's why you hear people send the 3 p.m. slump as well. You know, people go out for lunch, eat a lot of sugar. Three o'clock then, they're just, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I covered most of the thin, th 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 where the fuck did I get that list about it? Symptoms. I think I covered most of the symptoms. Uh, there's one more I didn't cover, which is vaginal dryness. Anyway, reason this happens is just lower estrogen, the wall line, or the proper word for it is vulvovaginal atrophy. I don't like that word. I prefer my word, just put fanny and atrophy together. Fanatrophy, way better, sounds better. So, the lack of estrogen causes that area to get thinner, less elastic, and drier. Look at him talking about vaginas. What does he know about it? called education. Ah, one thing I forgot to say though, not about the vagina, but the body, is a lot, say they put on a lot of weight during this time. And why is that? And it's because the adrenal uh, fatigue with the salt cravings, so the more salt you take in, the more water you're going to store because if you have high salt levels, the body will store more water because the body needs to keep homeostasis, which is a salt water balance a level also and then all the extra stress and cortisol that is making you go for the extra food and so on is putting you in a surplus and making you store more fat with the lower metabolism because your thyroid because your t3 and t4 has been able to use properly fucking hell thank god i'm not a woman so yeah i think i covered the symptoms. If anyone has any questions and has any more that I didn't cover, just send me a DM. And for fellas, <sighs> count yourselves lucky. We only have to deal with a decline in testosterone, you know. And if we're unlucky, we might lose the old horn. Women have to deal with a hell of a lot of shit. Here's one for you. For men, if you want to try and understand even when a woman is going through a period and you're saying, fucking hell, she's crazy, fucking bipolar. Think of a night out drinking the next day. Do you know when you're needy as fuck and you're, you're moody? That's estrogen because alcohol converts testosterone to estrogen. So yeah, the day after an old session, you're lying there hungover, whinge in the morning and narky and angry yeah that's estrogen so multiply that by thousand and um kind of give her a break then will you just do what i do sneak in a pack of chocolates 
and run for your fucking life. So you might be thinking, what age can this start to happen? The problem is no one really talks about it online. It's like a taboo area. It's like people are afraid, especially men as well. There's no one about it. And anyway, it can happen in your early 20s. You don't need to be 40, late 30s. It can actually happen early 20s. So it's more common than you think. So how can we alleviate the symptoms? Well, through nutrition anyway, of someone going through perimenopause. Well, number one is you can alleviate a lot of them through your diet. Uh, one of them is soy, because soy contains a plant-based estrogen called isoflavins. I only remember that because I think your man on the Simpsons. Isoflavins. Anyway, so by taking these plant-based estrogens in, it will help alleviate with dryness, night sweats, hot flushes, and so on. Okay, it may help alleviate them. I'm saying maybe because it might not work for everyone. So what contains soy? You have tofu, soy milk, soy beans, Edamames. Actually, there's a funny one. Edamame. Like, why you call it fucking Edamame? It sounds like a cheese. I got caught rotten ordering from a Chinese once. I thought it said Edam. Kind of cheese. I was disgusted when it came. Fucking beans. And if you don't like any of them, you can just buy a soy extract supplement. Next, what will help is taking in more D. Vitamin D. Yeah, dirty mind. Um, right, so the reason is because as estrogen lowers, you're at a greater risk of osteoporosis with the bones. So, we have strengthen your bones, but vitamin D is also associated with your mood. So, it'll help your brain. But you need to remember that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. You need fat in your diet for it to be absorbed. So if you're one of these people who, for whatever crazy reason, won't eat any fats or keep a low fat diet with fuck all fats, then you're just wasting your time taking vitamin D because it's not going to be utilized. So eat some healthy fats. And next we have DHEAs. Now just go into the shop and ask for that. You do not want to go in and so uh, uh, can I get some dehydroepiandrosterones, please? Yeah. You'll just look like a fucking idiot. And uh, so, yeah, just ask for DHEA. Okay, now, what it is, is a hormone that's usually produced in the adrenal gland to help produce other hormones and so on. But now there's a lot of conflicting studies. Um, some say they won't help you create estrogen and so on. But the other benefits is what I'm saying take it for is libido and your bone density and so on. Now, another one that is good for mood and helping you sleep will be L-tryptophan, which I actually take now. I think it was illegal in Ireland, but now not illegal, but you can still buy it up north. It's just an amino acid that's found in Turkey, but it helps the production of serotonin in the gut. Now I could name out all the supplements under the sun, but they'll never outweigh a good diet. So a balanced diet and the supplements might help alleviate symptoms. Now, another thing. I might be a science guy and I'm supposed to say homeopathy is pseudoscience. Don't believe any of them hippies. Now, to an extent, some of the shit that they try and sell would be like, okay, like you see some people come in and they come up with bucket loads of shit. Like, what's that you got there? Oh, this is the Petuna elegante scrotum flower. Oh, it's taken from the hills of Borneo, right underneath the scrotum of a chief leader who claims to have the healthiest scrotum on that side of the planet. Okay, well, you can keep your scrotum flower. A lot of stuff that's there, you can go, mm, but there is other remedies and other plants there that like have been shown to help, like St. John's wort for mood, I don't know if that's illegal in Ireland now again. They usually make everything illegal that works. But a good place to do your research on these kind of things would be looking at 
plants that would have been used by the Chinese, Chinese medicine and all this kind of stuff, thousands of years ago. If they use them back then and they worked, I don't see a reason why not. Okay, that was something like, oh, plants, oh, shit. Stupid, Chad, yeah, that's why people smoke weed. It's a plant. Even the strongest psychedelic known to mankind, 5-MeO-DMT, is secreted off the back of a toad. Now, I don't know how they kind of like found that out. Some guy just got around licking toads. There's a lot of things I don't know when you think about it actually through our history of like how people found out shit like, you know, I wonder how the first guy decided you could milk a cow. This should be a topic for another day. So what I'm saying is, if you are going to watch your diet and you're going to try and supplement to help alleviate the symptoms, obviously supplement with the things that have the most studies done on them and have shown proven results. And But do not like kind of throw homeopathy aside either. Have a look at like the past, what has been used and what has been used throughout history as well might help. So, so yeah. So if I missed any, or if you have any other questions, just send me a DM. But remember, excuse me, I am not a doctor and I'm not an endocrinologist. Um, I am just a nutritionist and I am explaining to you what is factual knowledge that is out there because it's not spoken about a lot. So I am not diagnosing anyone and do not take anything I said as a diagnosis. Now, don't get in your head now thinking that I know everything about women because even though I know a lot about biology, I know a lot about hormones, I study a lot in these areas all the time because it's always evolving. I have a level five in psychology and I'm now doing a level six in sports psychology. So you might think he knows women. No, I don't. I know the biology. I will never understand a woman's head. No man on this planet will ever understand a woman's head. Ever. So, I think I'll write a book, The Survival Guide for Men. And hopefully this video will educate a lot of men and have them thinking, okay, well, realize that their partner is not a fucking lunatic. That's... It's hormones, so give it a bit of a break, you know. As I said, chocolate's on the table. Fuck off, Albert's like. And that's it. Bye-bye.